Good evening, and welcome to Colorado Inside Out. I'm your guest host, Krista Kafer, Sunday columnist for the Denver Post. Tonight, we're joined by Patricia Calhoun, founder and editor of Westward, Penfield Tate of Tate Law, and a former member of the Colorado State House, Marianne Goodland, chief legislative reporter at Colorado Politics, and Alton Dillard, principal of the Dillard Group, LLC. A Colorado Sun investigation found that homeowner associations, HOAs, have filed roughly 3,000 foreclosure cases since 2018. More than 250 have resulted in properties being auctioned off, some for as little as $60,000. Last year, the General Assembly passed legislation to reduce HOA foreclosures. The governor and lawmakers, however, are considering additional actions. What more can they do? Patty. This was a real eye-opener. Great work by Jesse Pauls at the Colorado Sun. And I love the HOAs defending themselves by saying more banks do foreclosures. Well, two wrongs do not make a right here. It was appalling. We're not, we're not talking about the usual HOA jokes like fences painted the wrong color, don't put that little troll in your garden. But this was people who'd fallen behind on fees to the HOA, and then all of a sudden their accounts would skyrocket because they had late fees, they had attorney's fees, and they would lose their house for maybe 10000 in outstanding bills, a house maybe worth $500,000, and then it gets sold for $60,000. It was a real eye-opener. Also interesting was how many people are in houses that are part of HOAs, fully half the households of Colorado, and that was a shocker. So yes, the legislature needs to tighten things up. They thought they had, but they did certain lo there were still loopholes. They tightened it up for if you're find for that troll in the garden. They didn't really get into fines for late fees, and so that's a big issue they'll have to clear up. So only 8% ultimately were, were auctioned off. Is that a, a small amount? I mean, is this kind of a much ado about something rather small, or is this pretty significant, Penn? You know, Krista, it's significant. It's a small amount, unless it's your house. Then it's a big, it's, it's a huge issue. And Patty's right, the, the reporting on this was important, and it was well done. The, the difficult tension spot here is HOAs are a good idea if they're run properly. The idea that people who live in a common area ought to have some self-governance authority to sort of set standards for their community. Uh, the problem we've seen over the years is many people on HOA boards don't have any training, don't have any particular expertise or knowledge, and sometimes they can act out on personal vendettas. And so the hope is that as the legislature looks at this again, one of the things they ought to look at, or some things, are extending the notice periods in terms of how long a person has to respond, extending what we call the cure times, how much time you have to fix something you've been notified of, just limiting what an HOA can fine you over. Um, I have sued HOAs before, uh, <laughs> even though I think that they serve a purpose, but sometimes they just go overboard and they should never be taking someone's house. So Marianne, I'd live uh, in a trailer down by the river before I lived under an HOA, but I also get the point here, and that is that when people don't pay their, their uh, fines or they don't pay their dues, other homeowners have to pick up those costs. Do the HOAs have a point in what they're doing? I don't, I don't know that going all the way to taking somebody's home away for uh, failure to pay an HOA, due, HOA dues seems to, go, seems to be going way too far. Not to mention when a person loses a $500,000 house and, and it's sold for $60,000, that's equity that that person has put into that home. And, and that doesn't seem fair to me either. So the legislature has taken the action to start looking at this issue. The problem is that the task force that they set up through this legislation hasn't even been formed yet. They're not required to even be uh, together until November 1st. And then their report to the legislature isn't supposed to happen for another six months after that. So we're a good 18 months at a minimum away from legislative action on this. So in the legislation that was passed last year, as Marianne said, it was an important first step. It lengthens um, a number of deadlines. It makes sure that people get notified. What more do you think they can do? I mean, obviously, they don't have the report back from the task force, but is there any way to give relief now? Well, one of the things that needs to happen is more education around this because Colorado is a public trustee state. And as someone who worked for the Denver Clerk and Recorder, who also serves as public trustee under Denver's uh, home rule setup, 
we had a lot of confusion caused by this. Our phones first started ringing off the hook with people calling from the Green Valley Ranch and their HOA. And they just saw the word foreclosure and they were blowing us up. Now, of course, we were very customer and constituent centric. So we got them steered to the right place, but they need education and then also clarity around the process. In Denver, it's the sheriff's department that executes judicial foreclosures. It is not the public trustee. And so by the time you figure out, okay, so do we need to get the sheriffs involved or is that a county court matter versus a district court matter? That was the stuff we were trying to help these homeowners navigate. So I think A, education, and then Mary Ann makes a very good point about the uh, pace of the legislative process here, and especially given some of the tightness in our housing market, if someone loses their house now, where are they going to go? Two people with Colorado connections are among the 19 indicted in Georgia for attempting to overturn the 2020 election. Former University Colorado lecturer John Eastman represents the Colorado GOP in a lawsuit that uh, will close the June primaries to unaffiliated voters. Jenna Ellis is an advisory fellow at the Centennial Institute, which is affiliated with Colorado Christian University, where she once taught. As a lawyer, what do you think of this current case and against these individuals that is, is currently uh, just got a grand jury hearing and is uh, these folks have been indicted. Penn. Uh, you know, this, this indictment is huge and it's different. Um, this indictment fundamentally is about a concerted, a conspiracy, a concerted effort to overturn the election. Um, it is grounded in RICO, racketeering and influence law. I mean, this is gangster stuff. That's basically what the state of Georgia is saying. We have a bunch of gangsters who conspire to overturn our election. And what makes it so bad is at the local level in Georgia, you have elected officials, appointed officials on both sides of the aisle who said, this is garbage. We had clean elections. We had fair elections. There was no theft involved here. But the other thing to watch about this case is there are worrying overtones about a repeat of January 6th. Mm -hmm. Under state law in Georgia, the grand jurors, their names become public in terms of voting out the indictment. They're already getting threats and people are coming after them. The prosecutor has been threatened. Do you have the prime defendant, the former president, who is whipping the flames of, of that sentiment, much as he did in January 6th the first time. And so th this is going to be huge. It's going to be important to watch. Last important legal point is a conviction is one that a president cannot pardon themselves from. So if he takes a hit on this, he can't just pardon himself should he get elected president or if someone else gets elected president. So no get out, get out of jail no free card. No get out of jail free card on this one. <laughs> what do you think? I'm fascinated by the fact that they decided that RICO was, was the venue for uh, going after these 19 defendants. One of the other things that really fascinates me, though, is the behavior of these defendants as, as we've gone uh, through this, this first week of... Uh, after the indictment. And one of the stories that I saw the other day was that uh, Rudy Giuliani, who is not only a defendant in this case, but an unnamed, or we at least uh, believe that he's an unnamed co-conspirator in the D.C. Uh, January 6th indictment from Jack Smith. And he has made two trips to Mar-a-Lago in, in uh, recent months to uh, according to the reporting, to beg President Trump to help him with his legal fees. And Jenna Ellis now has a GoFundMe uh, to help with her legal fees. So obviously, the money that the former president is raising through his super PACs, he's not using to help his co-defendants. And I, I kind of wonder if that's a risky position to take, because if they're all going to get hung out to dry on what could be millions of dollars in legal fees, uh, certainly with Giuliani are seeing that, um, he's already selling a, a condo in New York to pay for his legal fees. That the, and the former president may be taking an interesting risk of people flipping on him because he's, he's throwing them under the bus and not helping. One of the things we also have to keep in mind here, this is America. So there's a couple of facts there. One, there is half the country that thinks that Trump is the epitome of America. And then there's another half that thinks he's an aberration from the American ideal. And see, the whole judicial process, you know, I was someone who was glued to the TV for both the OJ and the Rodney King verdicts. So I'm already just like after the 2016 election, 
I'm already mentally preparing myself to help my uh, liberal friends if he ends up walking. One of the things we have to remember is there's another Colorado connection, which is Dominion, which was the voting system involved in accusations in Arizona, in Pennsylvania, in Georgia. And they have definitely suffered, although they did get that nice Fox settlement. But nothing can pay for the pain they've gone through. And their employees have gone through with the same kind of threats we are now seeing happening to the grand jury in Georgia. It's The indictment is fascinating to read because it reads like a crime novel, because the the prosecutor really went for that RICO thing, which in Atlanta, in Georgia is a tool they use much more often and because of laws there than in other states. So it's going to be amazing to watch. I would like to recommend Rudy Giuliani get a new phone service. Look at the amount he is asking for. No way does someone still have phone bills of 55000 He's got a bad plan. <laughs> you know, but, well, one other thing to consider about this case, we're thinking about comments Marianne and, and, and Alton made. Number one, remember, this has been under investigation for two years. And so the reason this indictment is very detailed is they spent two years putting this together. And it's one of these indictments where you read it and it's like truth is weirder than fiction. And, and that's what we have here. Number two everybody's heard this recording of this president saying, hey, you got to find me 11,780 votes, one more than we have. That's kind of hard to dispel. And the final piece is people are what they are. Donald Trump throughout his entire career has hired lawyers, fired lawyers, not paid them, then turned around and sued them. <laughs> so all of these people who represented him and haven't been paid, they're not only going to get stiffed on the bill, another law firm is going to step up and then sue them. You know, I do have one question, and that is, and I think it's, you know, with your legal background, um, the concept of mens rea, right, guilty mind. Is it possible some of these people genuinely thought the election had been stolen and they were just simply doing what they needed to restore justice? Or can we be completely certain that every single one of them knew that, the, that Trump had lost and that he was now trying to cheat to win? Uh, the, the key point here is your belief has to be reasonably reasonable and based in something. When you have the president's own attorney general saying that all of this conspiracy stuff is BS, when you have Republican elected Secretary of State saying this crap is junk, when you have other elected officials in Georgia saying this is nonsense, we had clean, fair, good elections, you have to ask whether it's reasonable, and that's part of why this indictment came down, and that's part of why it's a RICO violation. All of these people are saying, well, let's just all get together and tell a lie and then push forward. And that's what this is. A new report from the Common Sense Institute estimates that if voters approve Proposition HH in November, most taxpayers will end up paying more taxes over the next 10 years than if the proposition fails. Joint filers could lose an estimated $5,119 in Tabor refunds over the next decade while still seeing a sizable property increase, property tax increase. Polling data suggests that voters' opinion on Proposition HH changes as they hear more about the proposal. What do you think of the report? I think you will see um, this targeted toward a particular group of people, and that's renters. They don't get anything out of this other than the, if Prop HH passes, everybody gets the same Tabor refund. But past that, and that's just one year, past that, any property tax increases gets passed on from landlords to, to renters. They're not gonna see any benefit from it. And their Tabor refunds are gonna be used to pay for this property tax relief, um, this small, fairly small property tax relief. So I think you will see a lot of this in the campaign materials as we head into the fall. Uh, right now, the only folks who are putting money into this campaign are wealthy Democrats and Democratic organizations that are going to um, be backing Prop HH and telling voters to back it. But the one thing you have to remember is what voters think about anything dealing with taxes. They tend to go very conservative on it. If they think they're going to lose money, if they think they're going to get nailed for this, they're not going to like it. And the Magellan polling showed that the more that people learned about Prop HH, the less they liked it. Will this sort of thing influence other people? Will they do the math? Alton. I hope they do the math along with the reading. And so it's actually heartening to me that people are actually taking time to do the deep dive. And as I've said on this air before, you know, had we had that same lens during Tabor, we may be in a different 
part of uh, this discussion. You know, that's the thing so fascinating about Colorado and I always tell this to my transplants. This is still the wild, wild west out here. You've got a rugged individualism. You've got a, you know, sort of a hands off. Let's all just do what we're going to do thing. Now you're messing with people's money. And to Mary Ann's point, the impact on renters, you know, that's one of the whole reasons that a lot of people choose to become property owners because it's supposed to provide some level of output stability when it comes to your housing costs. So now if you're going to be experiencing, you know, big spike here or to your point, you know, one time front end payoff and then three years down the road, you're just getting hammered. I just don't think it has a shot. Speaking of reading, I read the Blue Book uh, draft, and honestly, I think an IKEA directions manual uh, makes a little bit more sense. It's pretty darn complicated, Patty. They're already going crazy because they're seeing that their property tax protests, their assessment protests, for the most part, have been turned down. You know, so I think it's seven out of ten across the state have been turned down. So any property owners are already going to be cranky before they see that Blue Book. Now. People can still protest the wording of the blue book, I think, this week, but I don't see any reason it's going to become like a little golden book that we grew up reading. It's not going to become that much easier. And in the meantime, you're going to people are mad. They're mad that they're being charged for their trash pickup now. Yep. They're mad that their their house assessment didn't go down. The only th and they're not going to see how big their property tax bill is until after they voted for this, which probably will put proponents of HH at a disadvantage. Penn, what do you think? You know, I, I, my comments are sort of like Alton's. Um, the fundamental problem is prior to 1992, the Colorado General Assembly did something very weird. They did their job. When revenues were up, they reduced taxes because they could do that just with a bill. When revenues were low, they raised taxes because they could do that with a bill. And when things were okay, they just left things as they were. Once we passed Tabor in 92, we changed the entire dynamic. We put things on autopilot. We created this false concept of a surplus when there really wasn't such a thing. But more importantly, we passed a number of other statutes and constitutional amendments that have simply locked money in to certain pots and pools and doesn't allow the state or local governments to move them around. And so we keep trying to pass another piece of legislation to fix an inequity or, or a problem we see, and it just compounds on itself. So at, at some point, Alton's right, you can read, you can study, but we've got to think and actually have an honest conversation about how we do or undo all of this junk to get out of this mess. The state's free preschool program is off to a rocky start. A shortfall in funding changed eligibility requirements, and not all kids with risk factors will be eligible for the 30 hours of preschool a week that they were promised. Meanwhile, the Denver Catholic Archdiocese and two of its par parishes are suing the state on First Amendment grounds because their schools cannot participate in the program if they uphold the church's teaching on sexuality. As the school year gets rolling, the program will, it could end up meeting supporters' expectations. What do you think, Alton? Well, first of all, this was a classic moment from our libertarian governor. That was a let them eat cake moment when he made the remarks about people just wanting free preschool. And so I've been around government long enough to always understand that anytime something is brand new, the rollout is going to be bumpy. So I think they're going to be able to get a lot of the bumps ironed out of it, but it also came down to a messaging issue because there's still been a lot of discussion. It's like, hey, the cap on hours was, should have been known up front. And it's like, but no one told us about that cap on the hours. And then to the part about the lawsuit, um, I'm really interested to hear what Penn has to say about this because this gets into not only First Amendment, but church and state. So the Catholics are saying our doctrine, but you know, I'm not trying to be flip here, since he lets us discriminate based on our belief. And so you've got the governor's office saying, yeah, but there are other faith-based schools that are accepting this money. So I really am going to be interested to see how this turns out. Thank you, Alton. Patty. Well, so all our toddlers are going to get a lesson in, what, in discrimination and what is allowed 
uh, if this passes, I don't think the lawsuit will make it. But the other lesson we're getting is you need to budget in advance when you come up with a new program. You need to figure out how it's going to be paid for and that there's enough money to do everything you've promised and then make sure you're very clear to the people who will be affected. It's a great idea to promise a certain amount, amount of free preschool. You just want to be sure you can provide it. You know, there's a couple things. You have the balance with church and state mm -hmm. in, in terms of the uh, anti-establishment clause. And so the question, and we've had that issue before when it came to charter schools mm -hmm. in Colorado, also in private schools, whether those schools can get state funding when they push uh, a per point of view that is by their own admission, part of advocating their religious beliefs. And that's the problem with the First Amendment argument here, because you have other countervailing uh, amendments that tell you you can't do that. But I offer a common sense question that some friends of mine just asked me. We're talking about preschool, and, and universal preschool I think is good. One of the things we have in this country is, unlike other developed countries, we don't do a good job of educating our kids and pushing through um, their ability to be educated. But if we're talking about three, four, five-year-olds, why do we want anybody teaching them about sexuality at three, four, and five? Just food for thought. <laughs> interesting food for thought. Marianne? Um, I think this has pointed to an inter the interesting summer that the governor has had on um, some of these issues. You, you started off with um, him going on CNN and saying abortion is bad, which really upset his allies uh, in the um, among the women Democratic lawmakers. There was a, an op-ed in the Denver Post about it this this past weekend. Uh, and then he was down at the inauguration of the, Col the new Colorado Springs mayor, uh, in which he said, this is, a, this is a community that just had one of the best gay pride parades in the country, and at the same time has focus on the family, and, and that upset Democratic allies. And then you have the universal pre-K uh, rollout that has not exactly uh, been the best. For a governor who has had a great deal of success in his first term. His second term is off to a pretty rocky start. Second terms generally are. Yeah. And now it's time for that favorite part of the week, and that is the disgrace of the week and an opportunity to say something nice. Patty. I don't normally go outside Colorado borders, but going over to our neighbor, Kansas, where the cops raided the uh, let's see, the Marion County record, small paper owned by a mother and son, the mother was 98 years old, raided the newspaper office for, in a story that hadn't even run, took everything, and the, the mother wound up dying because of the shock. So leave the newspapers alone. As we see from the Sun story on HOAs, they do a good job. Penn. Yeah, you know, it's um, the new administration has taken office in Denver, and unfortunately, they're going to have to deal with an issue that we've been plagued with. That we've got another police shooting, mm -hmm. um, killing an, an armed black man, and at some point, it's got to stop. We've got to fix this. Marianne, to the Denver Broncos, please don't have another year like last year. <laughs> I don't think we can take it. I'm, I'm, I'm just so tired of seeing seeing poor performance on the field and not. Uh, and, and nobody really being held accountable. So, so come on, guys, step it up. Alton. And my disgrace is the fact that uh, black history is being erased. We have these movements going on in Arkansas, removal of black history from curricula, not having AP black history being credit worthy anymore. You've got essentially history that somehow got buzzworded as CRT. It, it's history. And so this belief that, hey, you know, you're out here making a certain group feel bad based on the sins of their fathers, that's horse feathers. It really truly is. And so I'm wearing this lapel pin that says America I Am. It's from an exhibit that uh, Tavis Smiley toured around the country showing our history and then also being fortunate to be friends with people like Robert Smith who gave a sizable donation to the Museum of the African American at the Smithsonian. We need to keep our history alive and we need our allies to help step up. Patty, something nice. We lost John Fielder, the great photographer this week. But he left such an incredible legacy. He gave 7,000 of his best photographs to the state of Colorado. They're at History Colorado. You can download them. You can put them up in your house. You can use them. And you can just look at them to remember what a beautiful state it is and what a generous man he was.
Penn. Yeah, and I was just going to amplify Alton's point. Don't forget Florida, where they're being taught now that slavery was a good thing because it yes. was a skills training program. Skill building. Um, <laughs> I echo Patty's um, something nice, John Fielder. I'm on the board of History Colorado, and we were honored and pleased to have him donate his works to History Colorado, the state's museum, to preserve his iconic works for the state of Colorado in perpetuity. And to get some time visiting with him, walking through the exhibit, and having him explain what his favorite shots were, it was just, it was priceless, and he will be greatly missed. Marianne. I want to salute Colorado agriculture. The months of July and August are like the best of the whole year when you have uh, the Palisade peaches coming in and the Rocky Ford melons. And despite Olathe having a little bit of bug problems this year, the Olathe sweet corn, this, this is just the best time of year to be a Coloradan. Amen. Alton. And I'm actually going to shout out Patty Calhoun for the website redo. Westward's website went from being pretty much one of the jankiest in the market to <laughs> one of the better looking ones. And it is navigable, crisp, clean, and visual. Great job, Patty, and your team at Westward. Thanks. Well, that's all the time we have, unfortunately. I want to thank all of our panelists for their insights. Y'all are fantastic. And uh, thank you everyone out there for watching Colorado Inside Out on PBS Channel 12. Check us out at pbs12.org or our YouTube channel. And everyone, have yourself a fantastic night.